Hey there, you're listening to the Generations Church Podcast. We pray that the Word of God today will challenge, change, and channel you into your God-given destiny. Now let's get started. Hi there, I'm Andy Yo, the pastor of Generations Church. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We don't usually do this on our podcast, but then this is no usual episode. The speaker of today's message is Pastor Timothy Lo, who was the senior pastor of Every Nation Church Malaysia. He was one of my mentors and spiritual father and was someone who made a great impact in my life. Him and his wife, Pastor Teresa, personally spent time with my wife and me to guide and coach us in both life and ministry. And we are not even members of his church. So we are tremendously blessed and grateful for their love and care. You know, Pastor Tim taught us many things. He was generous with his knowledge, wisdom and experience. He didn't hold back any secrets of his success. No questions were out of bounds. He was wise, successful, and larger than life, yet always had a posture to listen and to learn. We often go to him to ask questions, to learn from him. But many times he would turn back and ask us questions to learn from us. What a humble man. He was vulnerable, real, and authentic with us. He was a real and true inspiration to me. But why did I say was? Well, it's because on April 6, 2024, the day this message was recorded live in our church, he came to our church as a guest speaker, something we had been planning for many months. So we were very excited that he could finally come to speak to the church. But after he delivered his sermon, and about an hour after the service was over, As he had finished his dinner and was about to address our leadership team, he collapsed suddenly. We now know that he had a massive heart attack and he was called home to be with the Lord. He is now safe and securely home with Jesus. I personally believe that Pastor Tim went to be with Jesus having lived each day to the full, literally, for the Lord, for his family and the people he has been called to love and serve. (laughs) I say literally because he often shared what a typical day would look like for him. He wakes up at 5 a.m. and starts his first appointment with people at 7 a.m. He then exercises from 2 to 4 p.m. playing his favorite sport, badminton, and he was very good at it. And then he continues with more appointments, meeting people from 5 p.m. to 12 a.m. He truly lived each day to the full. It always amazes me how he always manages to find and make time for people, yet never neglecting his time with the Lord and his family. And still, he had an enormous capacity to love and serve others. He's always thinking about others. He's always thinking, how can I love one more person to Jesus Christ? How can I help one more person? It is no wonder that his very last sermon delivered The one you are about to listen to is about loving and serving people, sharing with them and showing them the love of Jesus and inspiring and leading them into a relationship with the Savior. He called this the main thing. He exhorts us to keep the main thing the main thing, which means not to be distracted by anything else that is not really that important not to be bogged down by church programs or politics or processes, but to always remember the main thing for Jesus was saving lives and it should be our main thing too. When I think about it, it is quite poetic that the last time he preached and the last time he ministered and served was in someone else's church, not his own. It was not even a big church. It's a new, young and small church, just a little over a year old. He wasn't looking for a big platform or a big publicity or anything like that. He just wanted to serve the Lord and to help others. So, my church and I are incredibly humbled and honoured to have been given this special privilege to receive. And we will always remember this legacy forever. As you listen to this message, I pray that you too will be encouraged, inspired, and challenge to live your life to the full and to live for the one who created you and to live for His greater purpose in your life. May we all learn, like Pastor Tim, 
to keep the main thing the main thing uh, today i want to kind of hopefully help every one of us to walk away knowing what's the main thing and i and i know that generations church just kind of sovereignly got kind of uh, pieced that together and and Pastor Andy and Jay was telling me the story how the call of god and um and i think it's very important every time when we do church uh, what's the main thing? Okay, so all of us are familiar with the concept of the main thing, especially in a corporate world. Uh, Stephen Covey was the one that made that little statement. Would you read together? The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing, all right? Uh, all of us know that. But in his book, Stephen Covey was also trying to tell us that if you focus on the second thing or other things, you run the potential to actually lose your main thing. And I think that's really scary. You know, when I think about what's the main thing for church, uh, what, what does really God call us to do? Uh, when Matthew 16, the Bible says, Jesus said, I'll build my church. He kind of described, it's, it's a kind of church that the gates of hell will not prevail, right? And then three and a half years later, Acts 2, you sing happy birthday to the church and the church kind of had its own formation, 2000 plus years three till today. So there are really many, many expressions of church. I still remember that when I went to the States, uh, the first place that we visited when we touched down was a friend of mine. He said, hey, you know, we're on the way to, to the Bible College. And then he says, I will, I'll bring you through the downtown because there's a church called Elvis Presley Church where Jesus Christ's picture and Elvis are together. Uh, so you can see that when it comes to this concept of church, you have so many different expression and variation as well, uh, which really, really contends with today's social media world, how much is online church, how much is on-site church, all of that, okay? But in the smack of all this, I think there were so many things that compete with the concept of church on the main thing. Uh, today world, you will have groups of believers, potentially they are very much into end times, Okay. Their whole life is to look at an event, try to find a passage in the Bible and say, this fulfilled this verse. Uh, with the recent upheaval in the Middle East. So many people just immediately zoom into that. When COVID happened, so many, so many people thought it's going to be the end of the world. Uh, so you got the end time version of people who chase after that. But is that the main thing? So I find that we live in a world today where it is very important for us always to come back to the main thing, okay? Now, so this is, this is the way I have always been wanting to keep the main thing, the main thing. So Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, which is a very common verse because everywhere you go, every church wants to make disciples, but everybody does it very differently, okay? Now, so would you read together? Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of age. Okay, let, let us pray. God, we come humbly before you. God, we want to invite your presence. God, I pray for the next 30 minutes or so, God, you will uh, give us, oh God, Lord, just a clarity, just a clear trumpet call uh, why we exist as a church. And that, Lord, we are able to walk away one thing to make disciples. And that simply means we will make disciples starting from people who actually do not know you. So I thank you. I pray for the favor of God. Thank you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, all of us are very familiar with this verse. Okay. Am I correct? How many of you, you have not seen this verse? Okay. I'm sure all of you have. Okay. Now, there are many lenses to look at this, this verse. No matter how you look at it, I'm going to kind of, kind of walk you through a little bit. First of all, you can look at it from a relational lens. Uh, Jesus had three and a half years, very interesting relationship with the disciples, so much so that the Bible tells us that when Jesus wanted to leave, it was the disciple, Jesus told the disciple, he says, why, you know, why do you feel sad? Like, like you're losing me. You're often as such, right? So it tells you that it was very close-knitted kind of a community. 
Uh, so you can look at it from a relational lens. Jesus gave his last words. Uh, last words are all important. Uh, I know of a lot of men and women of God who will, who will honour the last word of a particular person. Uh, just about last year Christmas, was, which was quite a very funny story. Uh, it wasn't funny, okay, but it was, quite, it, it was quite a story. So last year, we did a little production. And then we wanted to go by uh, 20 ringgit per ticket, okay? And the goal is we, we do not, we, we are not looking for the money, but we are looking for people to pay so that they can confirm the seats, okay? So our goal was to have 3,000 to 4,000 people that will come by uh, for that production. That was, that was our heart's desire. So we will pretty much go by, we will we'll receive about 60,000, you know, or so, right? And uh, so we make the announcement to the church. Uh, the next day, uh, two to three of our church people text me, says, Pastor, uh, you know, the production falls on Sunday. Um, it, it feels strange that people have to buy a ticket to come to service. I thought for a while, I said, you know what? Scrap it. So I went back to her whole church. The next day, I said, you know what? We're not going to charge anything. Uh, but you help to invite your friend that will book the seat because we are not looking at the amount of money. Uh, what turned out to be quite a fair, good production, somewhere along the journey, uh, the one that did the production came to me, he says, Pastor, so if we would have charged ticket, Pastor, we would have gotten, you know, 50, 60,000 ringgit. I kind of smiled and said, uh, you know, that, that's not important. Uh, and, and you know what? Just about two days later, I received a call from one of our church members who passed away and the sister actually called me. And then she said this. She said, Pastor Tim, uh, my sister, you know, in her will, her last words, she actually wanted to give a love gift to the church. And, uh, and she gave the exact amount that would have actually translated to if you were to sell the tickets, okay? But you know, how many of you, we will always honour the last word, right? The, the person that said that last. Uh, if you look at it from a story plot point of view, how many of you would understand that the last segment of the story or the narrative actually makes sense of the entire story, right? How many of you watched Endgame Part 1 and decided not to watch Part 2? Anyone? N none of us, am, am I correct? Uh, of course, all the, you know, all the Transformers don't need to watch Part 1, Part 2. Lah. That one means very little, okay? But the Endgame means a lot because Part 1, if you watch it, Spider-Man dies. So many of them dies, right? It's only Part 2 or the end of the story that makes sense of the rest of the... So what I'm trying to say is, uh, so Matthew 28 is what makes sense of Matthew 1 to 27. So if you can actually reread Matthew 1 to 27 with Matthew 28, the last word, it gives you a very different lens. For example, Matthew 28, Jesus told them, let's gather at Galilee again. Now, if you study the Bible carefully, you'll find that Matthew 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, somewhere where Jesus gave them the commandment to go to a house of Israel and to preach the gospel, he gave it at Galilee. And, and Jesus has to almost re-give them a fresh commandment. So Matthew 28, story plot point of view, is always the last story, the last portion that makes sense of the rest. Uh, if you look at it from an instruction lens, which means that, for example, if I were to go away for a trip, uh, and then I'll, I'll go to all my kids, right? I'll go to my elder son, Joel. I say, Joel, you know, your math is very good. Please make sure you teach your sister math because it was myth to my daughter. It was math to my son, okay? And then I'll go to my second son and say, Joash, uh, you know, please um, uh, please sleep early and then, you know, help to do the house chore. And I go to my third son. I say, uh, Jaden, you know, I want you to be able to be a good brother. Uh, I want you to take care of your younger sister. Make sure you send her to school, right? And then go to my daughter and say, uh, Joanna, could you finish all your math and whatever, right? Okay. And then after about two weeks when I came back, uh, what do you think I would do? At some point, after giving them all the gift that I bought back, at some point, I'm going to ask Joel, did you teach Joanna math? Am I correct? At some point, I'm going to say, Joe Ash, will you be a good son? Will you be responsible? Okay, right. All of us will do that. Now, the day will come, the Bible says, when we meet Jesus. And I think Jesus is going to ask us, did we make disciples? And I think that will be one question that we're being asked. And sometimes I feel one of the things that we have done as a church is we, we write songs about the Great Commission. 
we do a drama about Great Commission. We do pantone. We do, you know, you know what I'm saying? We did everything, but potentially not Great Commission. So it's just like I came back home and all my son and my daughter say, Dad, you know what? We put on a skit for you. And the skit, my son would say, I'm supposed to teach her. They did everything. They write a song. They do a skit. They do a big poster, drama, welcome back, Dad. You know what I'm saying? But what they didn't do was exactly did what I've asked them to do. All right? So, and then from the last angle is from a theological point of view. I'm not too sure whether you're aware, but Jesus, the Bible tells us that he rose from the dead and he was with the disciples for about 40 days. If you study the Bible carefully, you'll, you'll find that Jesus did only three things. Number one, he comforted all the disciples. He says, I am Jesus, uh, the one that was with you. And then number two, uh, the Bible tells us that, what do you do? He explained the Bible. He, he, he took out the scriptures all, all the way from law, the prophets, the Psalms. He helps them to see that it all speaks about him. And the third thing that he did for the 40 days, at different platforms, in the mountain, in the room, he told them about the Great Commission. So it was very clear that was one big single focus. All right, now. And, and I realized when I think about the Great Commission, uh, the tipping point for Great Commission is really ownership. It really boils down to how much do we really own it? Does it, does it express in the way you think, you live your life, and how much we really, really uh, made it to be part of who we are? All right? Now, I'm just going to go very quickly. Uh, so, in the early days with the disciples, when Jesus asked them to go make disciples, and literally that's where they went. Uh, they went to all over, and this is just a potential suggestion. Where did all the disciples go? From Africa, Europe, all the way to India, and all of that. And that's what the disciples actually did. Now, I'm saying all of that to bring everybody to one single simple point. Um, you know, so I've been a pastor for a long time. And throughout the journey, I've, I've obviously led many people to Christ along the journey. It was Paul who, who translated what does ownership towards the gospel means, okay? And I love the way Paul says this. You know, this afternoon, I'm not sure if we were to go to different one of you and say, hey, when it comes to a great commission, what would be the phrase that you will attach to it? Maybe some of you would say that, I try. Some of you would say that, I'm too busy. Some of you would say that, Actually, I don't know how to do it. Uh, some of you will say that, Pastor, uh, just not my thing. Uh, I don't know what would we say. When you ask Paul, what would he say about ownership towards the gospel? Romans 1.14, he says, I'm actually obligated. Uh, I, I don't know whether any one of you ever felt you owe it to someone. Um, and, I, and I think when it comes to the gospel, you need to have a realization Everything that has happened in your life, there is a gospel sense to it. I don't know how to explain this, but you know, when I was young, uh, I come from my, my father is a my father is a Chinese school teacher, and then he's a disciplinarian. And uh, when you when you have a Chinese traditional father and a disciplinarian at school, that's a very lethal combo when it comes to discipline. So when we were young, we were cane almost every day. Every week, it sure got some form of punishment, man. Uh, and, you know, all our report card, when we give our report card, we need to take the report card and the cane to my father. Uh, that's, that's the way we grew up. Uh, so when we were young, my father uh, forced all of us to learn Chinese. So I, I, I learned Chinese all the way to, you know, Form 5, you know, Chinese, right? Wen Yen Wen, you know, Yue Fei, Man Jiang Hong, you know, all of that, okay? So if, if you know Chinese, lah, so I've learned all of that. But you know what? I, I hated learning Chinese because it's difficult. Uh, but it makes sense to me uh, many years ago, maybe about 12 years ago, when I was, I made a trip to China. And then I was preaching the gospel in China. And I will never forget when I was able to understand and after and able to preach in Chinese, I came back home, I called my father and with tears, I tell my dad, I say, dad, 
Thank you so much for forcing me to learn Mandarin. And now I know why I learned Mandarin. This whole entire obligation of something that God has put in your life, that you owe it maybe to a particular group of people, you owe it to your family, whatever, but obligated both to Greeks and non greeks both to the Jews. And then he says, this is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel. I'm not too sure whether are we, are we as eager as Paul. But Paul was so eager to preach the gospel that you know the story, Paul, when he was in prison, he was so eager, he was so excited. And the Bible tells us that the entire palace guard actually get to hear the gospel. That was how eager he was. And finally, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power. You know, Paul have this three little, I call it the gold standard. That means anytime you think about the gospel, think of Paul. Because, the, because Paul was the one that really took the Great Commission to the furthest ever in his lifetime. Okay, now, so I want to tell you a little bit of my story, okay? So this is, this is actually 2017. 2017 was the year where I had the biggest breakthrough when it comes to the Great Commission. So prior before 2017, um, I, I, I'm a very faithful pastor. I worked for a company called Datacraft for 10 years. And then I owned my restaurant for about 14 years. And uh, so I was happily doing both. And I was rather, I did well, okay? Both church and also in the marketplace, all right. I did pretty okay. Uh, but I, I had this holy dissatisfaction, which means that God, if the good news is so good, uh, why is it so difficult sometimes for people to get it? Uh, maybe is the message. Our message wasn't very clear. Maybe we were too fast to label people as sinner. You need to repent. Maybe repentance wasn't their language at all. Maybe we would have just gone another route. Maybe a mental health route might be, might be better in today's world. You know, so I kind of wrestled. Or, or maybe it's a messenger that did not live up. Uh, because the good news is pretty incredible. God actually died for your sin. No other belief system, anyone would have died for your sin. Am I correct? You know, so when I kind of wrestled that through, so 2017, what I did was, I went to, I went around trying to connect with as many, as many people who actually do not know God. In our language, we call it unchurched. Uh, so, so I can tell you some of them. For example, this is actually Louise. Uh, she was, I went back to ground zero. She was the first guest that come to church and I decided to contact the guests. So by then the church was about maybe 500, you know, five, five, six hundred. And normally for that kind of a size, the pastor won't connect. You will always outsource it to another leader. Uh, you know, obviously now we have, we, we, again, I, I don't like, I don't like to say numbers, but even today, I'm still connected with the guests. Uh, so I decided to go ground zero and I went. So this is the first person that I actually connected. Her name was Louise, which led her to Christ and, and then led the boyfriend or husband-to-be to Christ, did their wedding. And they migrated to Australia when I was in Melbourne. They hosted me for two weeks. And, uh, and it was so honoring because he literally bought a sport car just to bring me around. Uh, and he says, uh, Pastor, this is only for you one, okay? And, and you know, so I was just so honored. And all of them, so all of them was just friends. Uh, this is actually our architect. Uh, and the architect was so fearful to come for a session, and this is a session we call Discovering God. After God, she actually brought this person, which she actually accepted Christ, not him. So I started just to meet as many people that I do not know, uh, including the counselor for my son's education. I, I just I just meet as many, and I started this thing called a Discovering God, which is one thing to talk about how to connect the dot who God is, okay? So 2017, I gathered them. Uh, by 2018 middle, the group grew bigger and they then invited their friends and a whole bunch of people. And at the end of the day, uh, we have all these people who are the one that accepted Christ, okay? All kinds of different backgrounds. So today, for example, this guy is Zeth. I don't know whether Zeth and Kalmin owns Verdon, which is the, 
the fastest growing solar panel for household right now. They just broke the Malaysian record. Uh, so they, they got saved in 2018. And to date, are life group leaders. Okay? And some of them, and they were only three years old. For example, Zeth and Kalmin, a very important leader of ours right now, he's, a, he's our preacher for our Chinese church. And he's only three years old Christian. He leads about 30 to 40 people. All, he, he runs all our PMC, premarital. And I can go one by one. And uh, uh, for example, Sime is one of our leaders. She has uh, uh, run about two to, two to three live groups. And they were all very, very young Christians. Uh, so it was really a joy to see. And, and, and through that entire incident of just going back to ground zero, relearning what it means to make as many unchurched friends as possible. And, uh, and literally from then to date, just as a personal, just being personal, uh, I think I've seen over 250 people accepted Christ for the first time. You're not even talking about people who backslided. Uh, and just last week itself, another three people who accepted Christ. So just this whole thing about Great Commission uh, became something that is very, very personal to my heart. And, and I always want the church to know that's the main thing. You know, as I come to Generations Church today, and I know Pastor Andy's heart, I know making disciples is, is big in this place. And when we talk about making disciples, oftentimes we think about wanting to take a Christian and make them a better Christian, which is nothing wrong with that. And sometimes in the Christian bubble world, we will have so many things that we can excavate and learn. No end. Which is why in the book of Acts, it tells us when Jesus told the disciples, he says, go therefore and make disciples, Acts 1.8. But nobody went until Acts 8.1 because of dispersion, because of persecution. Then everybody went and took the gospel, right? And can you imagine if you were in the early church, you have so much to excavate. Just the teaching itself, there's no end. Mother Mary teach about how to raise your son as God. The best parenting class. Everybody should sign up for it. Peter will come and teach you how to walk on water. No need to swim anymore. Right? I mean, every one of them, they, they will have enough. So something about, I think, as we exist as a church, the more we exist as a church, the more we need to think about people who actually do not know God. So my whole church knows that I will leave the 99 for one. That doesn't mean I don't bother about 99. I spend a lot of time there. But I make the greatest and highest priority just to be able to reach people uh, who actually do not know God. Now, I want, to, I want to tell you a little bit of this Jenna, right? Jenna was the girl that you saw earlier. That's Jenna. And this is Charlene. Both of them accepted Christ. Uh, and the story was this, okay? Now, this is how both Jenna and Charlene come to our church. Uh, one day, actually, they were, they were in U.S. This picture was taken in U.S. This is, uh, this is Charlene's son. I think his name is Samuel. Uh, Samuel, one day, he went into coma in States. And for about a week plus, he was in coma. When he woke up from coma, uh, he told the mom, he says, Mom, he says, he says, um, just before I went to coma, the last thing I did was I visited a friend's church, a Baptist church in U.S. And then, and then he says, maybe, maybe we should think about going to church and explore if there is a God. So, so the mom, they were in U.S. Now that Samuel is well, so the mom flew back to Malaysia. When the mom flew back to Malaysia, she wanted to fulfill the son's request of going to check out church. So she went around asking. And then they say, oh, there is this uh, Every Nation Church in Puchong. So she came. And when she came for her age, she needs a driver, a chauffeur, so, which, is, which is Jaina, the daughter. So when they first came, the daughter actually dropped the mother and then she go and do facial. And then she go and do other things. But because our service is about one hour, one and a half hours max, not enough time for facial. So after a while, I saw Jaina and the mom sit together. So this is about one month plus 
the mom, Jenna, uh, I think Shaling came to me one day. She said, uh, Pastor, you know, I, I've got a lot of questions. He says, I really want to meet up with you to, to talk. Okay. I said, sure. I said, no problem, Shalene. So I kind of opened up my schedule. I said, hey, you know what? Um, why don't you come over to my house for lunch uh, two Sundays from now? Okay. So the two Sundays from now, we had lunch at my house and uh, we had chicken rice. I'll never forget because it was the longest chicken rice conversation ever. She sat in my house for almost two and a half to three hours. So she came, we had chicken rice and she asked me non-stop questions about God. Just keep on asking me, what about this, what this, you know, Buddhism said this, what do you think? So I was just finding my time. And throughout all this while, Jaina was sitting down there looking at the handphone. So after the conversation, I, I turned to Jaina. I said, Jaina, um, any, any thought about God? And then she said, Pastor, the only thing I know about God is, oh my God. There was her exact word. She said, the only thing I know about God is, oh my God. And I went, oh my God. I'm just kidding, okay? Uh, and, 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 then, and then she said, uh, I said, okay, I said, Jenna, is there one thing I can pray for you? She thought about it. She said, hey, you know what, Pastor? I will be moving to US at some point after one or two years, and she's a physiotherapist. Uh, she said, I got a problem. Uh, all that I've learned and graduated as a physiotherapist, the American won't recognize. So I have to redo everything again. Say, would you ask God to help me? I said, sure. So I just pray a very simple prayer. God, you help her, a certificate, you know, all of that. Give us favor of God, you know. And then we ended the chicken rice, okay? Uh, we, we, we ended, we finished. The mother hasn't said yes to God because the mother has a lot of questions. Um, and then about two weeks later, I received a call from Jenna. Jenna called me. She says, Pastor, Pastor, you wouldn't believe this. Six paper that I, that I that I had for my physio, and as per what you asked me, I appeal. He says, four was approved. He says, the other two more, if I finish it with certain degree, with a, you know, because it's an external paper, if I finish with certain marks, it will be. He says, this is what a turnaround. And then she looked at me and says, wow, Pastor, thank you for praying. So I said, great. Then, obviously, I invited Jenna by then to come for a Discovering God. About two weeks later, the day we start our Discovering God, she called me. She said, Pastor, Pastor, I, now, now I'm a bit confused. I said, what's the confusion? She said, I went around and told my friend, actually, uh, I gotten this appeal, you know, all of that. And my friend told me, it's actually not God. It's actually the law of attraction. Have you, how many of you know, heard of the law of attraction? Now, I don't know what is the law of attraction. All I know is I'm attracted to my wife. My wife is attracted to me. Okay? So I said, I said, what is the law of attraction? Then she said, Pastor, you never heard of law of attraction. I said, I don't know. The law of attraction means you like something and then you'll get it and that's the law of attraction. She said, then she called me. She said, Pastor, I'm confused. People tell me it's not God. It's a law of attraction. I said, okay. I said, uh, would you come half an hour earlier before our session of discovering God? Why don't we talk about it? And I still remember, Jenna comes. She sat at my living room. I said, Jenna, what, what do you think is law of attraction? I said, Jenna, let me rehearse the entire story for you. And I look at Jenna. Jenna, it all started with your brother Samuel who was in coma. When he woke up from coma, he told your mom, you to go to visit the church. And then your mom came, to, came back to KL looking for a church. She found our church. Remember, you sent your mom and then you could not have time. You go for facial and then you came back again and then one day your mom bumped into me and then she said, you want to have chicken rice and we have chicken rice. How many of you watched Ant Man, right? Remember the guy that talked like that? I was just going around and I was just I was rehearsing the whole thing and then, you know, you came to my house for chicken rice and then, oh my God, oh my God, remember, oh my God. And then I prayed to, oh my God, and then, oh my God, answer you a question, you know, and then, I don't know, all this. And then, I said, I said, Jenna, come on, you are a degree person. You tell me, is it the law of attraction or God was at work in your life? Jenna heard everything. She's paused for a while. She said, has to be God, has to be God. You know, she then gave her life to Jesus and then she actually became the first life group leader out of the whole batch of people. And I, I tell you, she, she, she is right now in US. And I will never forget. So when we first started a life group where she became a life group leader, so as all these people got saved, what I did was I just, I just fanned them out to many groups. So along the journey, 
they came back to me and says, Pastor, could you, could you lead a live group? Because we know you. Uh, we are not comfortable. I said, okay, okay. Lah. I said, we do a live group. Lah. So we did our first live group. Okay, Our first live group, very funny, because after dinner, we got smoking break. Because three of them are chain smoker. So after, the, after our dinner, they say, Pastor, before live group start, nah, can we go smoking first? I say, can, okay? So all of them will go out. They'll, they'll smoke. I'll also be there. Of course, I don't smoke. Lah. So I will be there. And, and then, miraculous, six months later, one day they say, you know what? I don't think God is happy with our smoking. I think we need to stop. Uh, and they went for a victory weekend. All three of them immediately quit smoking, okay? But our first live group was led by Jenna. She is such a young Christian. And as you remember, it was nine months down the road. She was leading the group. And then they celebrate me and my wife's birthday in November. When we were in the group, she sat down there. She said, you know what, Pastor Tim? Uh, you are November. Your wife is November. You both are Scorpio. Now I explain why you guys are so... I was like, no, 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 no. We don't believe in that, okay? Uh, I then have said, no, no, Jenna. We actually... Oh, oh, you mean we cannot believe in that, Okay. You know, we were so messy. But you know what? There was so much joy. There was so much tears. There was so much thing that God did with a whole bunch of people who actually know God so little, but love so much. And, and we pieced together the group. When we pieced together the group, I told, I told everybody in the group, I said, this life group will only exist for one year then we will no longer be in existence. They say, ah, Pastor, why? I said, no, no, no. We exist in different way. By then, every one of you lead a life group. Last year, about five years later, Jaina, four or five years later, she came back from US. The first question she asked when she met up with me, she says, Pastor, did everybody lead a new life group? You know what? The whole idea of Great Commission is very simple. Just being faithful to show the love of God to everyone that comes across your path. And as you are faithfully doing that, you see God at work. You see God at work. You see God at work. I want to encourage generations. You know, church exists not just for Christian. Church really exists for a lot of people that only heard of, oh my God so that we are able to help them to piece together some substance about who this oh my God is. That this God will be the God that will help them to navigate through every season of their life. Can good amen? I want to encourage you. As you go about, uh, I, love, I love the name of this church. I love the giftings that God has given uh, to this church. And we are here to cheer you. We are here to work with you. We are here to bless you. We are here to do everything we can uh, to encourage all of you so that together uh, we can make many, many, many disciples for Jesus. Can good amen? Thank you for listening to the Generations Church Podcast. We hope you have been blessed by the Word of God today. Remember to stay tuned by subscribing to this podcast for more inspiring content. Do share it with your family and friends. Follow and tag us on social media at Generations My. For more information, check us out on bit.ly slash Generations My.